Thank you, Josh. Thanks for that introduction. And thank you to everyone that um, shared your lunch hour with me. As Josh said, I am a Cherokee County Master Gardener. I'm also a 32 year veteran of our local real estate community. So as you can imagine, over those years, I've opened a lot of doors. I've seen many homes. I see them, everything from the fabulous to the frumpy. Uh, but really today, I really want to talk to you about your home. Um, your home, probably the most expensive purchase you ever made. So let me. So, and as of today, owning a home in Cherokee County is, um, it's a great year to be a homeowner. I have a graph here. I don't know, I hope you can all see it. This is based on data provided by our FMLS system. It traces, uh, it lists all our inventory. It's, it issues all the reports. It's the hub of the real estate community. So as you can see from this graph, this blue line here is actually Cherokee County home sales. The red line is uh, real estate sales in the rest of the counties in the metro area. So that takes everything all of the metro Atlanta counties going north, south, east, and west. So our median home sales price in 2021, so far this year is $375,000. That is actually up 21% in the last 13 months. So for years we trugged around at, you know, if we got 3%, 4% a year, we thought we were doing great. So as you can see, Great year to be a homeowner, not so great year to be a first time home buyer, but, and this uh, is also reflected on a national scale. Obviously real estate is very local. So some markets do better than others, but as a general statement, um, homes all over the nation have been uh, appreciating much more rapidly this year. And actually, According to the 2020 census, 68.4% of uh, Americans own their own home. That doesn't mean they're mortgage free, but 68.4%. That has stayed somewhat steady over the years, slight decrease lately since probably 2006, but still pretty good stats. So why am I quoting you real estate statistics? I'm actually want to emphasize, um, in case you are not aware of this, what a valuable appreciating asset that you have um, and that your home simply deserves an ongoing maintenance and update. And they need to be significant. Um, they, so the next time your spouse fusses at you for going out and buying plants, just remind them that you are investing. You are not spending money, but you are investing in your appreciating assets. So today, since we're titled Curb Appeal, um, I wanna to talk to you uh, about Curb Appeal and give you what my definition is. Um, hang on, I gotta move this. The, um, I'm gonna move this. Um, curb appeal, I define as the immediate uh, uh, initial assessment of your home based on its exterior appearance. Now, it used to be that um, assessment was made sitting at the curb, hence the name. But nowadays, uh, it can be made online. Um, you know, we are a very visual society. So even real estate has taken on a match dot pro -chicom. Uh, match.com approach. So, um, you know, it's critical in a real estate application because often it decides whether or not you are going to have the opportunity for your house to get shown. So we make decisions, like I said, either from the curb or from leafing through uh, realtor.com or Zillow. Um, and we choose houses from that point forward, not we as, as agents, but certainly as buyers. So if you don't have that best face forward, sometimes you never get a, that second chance. So you never get the chance to show your wonderful hardwood floors and the rest of the inside house. So 
we want to follow that good advice that our mom and dad always gave them. My mom always said, Nancy, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. So put that best face forward. So speaking of faces, um, I want you, well, first of all, I want, I have homework. I actually have homework for you. So um, sometime today or tomorrow, if you have a minute, you might want to uh, leave your house, cross the street, stand at the street, and try to look at your home objectively. So it's hard to do, I know. Um, look at it as a neighbor um, or as a guest to your house, uh, not as an owner, certainly. And you don't want to look at it as a seller or a buyer. Um, so remember, your home sends an invitation. And we want it to make sure it's the best invitation. So it, it has nothing to do with the size or the cost of your home. Um, there's curb appeal over the entire range of homes. So, um, so the first thing we're gonna talk about is landscaping because that's obviously the most prominent thing we see from, uh, uh, from our curb. Um, and you know we have different size lots, um, but I always try to make the comparison of landscaping um, is to your home, uh, what your hair is to a pretty face. So think of your face as, a, think of your home as a pretty face. And let's think about the landscaping that we attach to that face, just like hair. So, uh, landscaping is purely aesthetic, other than perhaps providing some shade for your yard. We use it to hide flaws and to make our house look bigger. Uh, we want it to look, uh, add depth to our house. We want to hide that downspout or those trash cans. Um, and that's kind of the same thing we do with our hair. You know, if we have big ears, we grow our hair long. If we have a five head instead of a four head, we cut bangs in. So we do the same thing with our landscaping. So um, considering probably very few of us actually had the chance to make uh, choices in the landscaping of our house when it was built, builders have uh, certain budgets they work with. Um, I know that uh, your landscaping is the very last thing that goes into your house. Um, so sometimes um, we're down to the uh, fact of the hard facts of budget as to what was planted in your yard. So I'm not trying to start from scratch here. I just want to give you a, maybe a few suggestions, a few pitfalls to avoid um, that may help, uh, may add and boost your home um, appeal. You know, I'm using the term uh, curb appeal, and I don't mean to do it strictly in a real estate application. You're probably going to be in your house for the next 50 years. So just think of uh, curb appeal as a reflection of the pride you put in your house. So still, you never know. Sometimes opportunities arise and our situations change. And you know, you may have to be in a position you never thought you'd be in, but uh, I'm trying to separate curb appeal from just a real estate application here. So one thing many of my buyers noted uh, looking at properties. So anyways, we're gonna go over these five things right now. So the first thing I wanna talk about is one that's probably a pet peeve to a lot of you and buyers and and your neighbors do notice this. So um, it's very important to always make sure that we have the right plant in the right place. And when we say right plant, that means that we obviously have to know the qualities of that plant. We need to be aware of the height. We wanna know uh, not only how tall it gets, but how wide it gets, what it tolerates as far as sunshine and shade. Uh, does it tolerate wet feet? We want to make sure that it doesn't overgrow the rest of our landscape. Um, here are some things that we co I commonly see um, 
that never go unnoticed. Um, I think that probably three quarters of the split foyer homes out there, they have this lovely lower window. Um, that's the house in the middle. They have lovely windows at the bottom and most homeowners uh, plant something there that's gonna get six feet tall and they're obscured. This homeowner has planted, I think that's a lovely Japanese maple. The rest of the landscaping is lovely, but he's completely obscured that, um, uh, that lower window. Um, the ranch home to the far left of the screen, that's uh, behind that window, there was a lovely triple Palladian window, probably the most expensive window in the entire house. And um, it's hidden by a $40 crepe myrtle. So, um, and it's just gonna get bigger here. That's a fairly new home. These homes over here, I'm sure that the owner never ever imagined that they would get that tall. So either they get to be a maintenance nightmare or they're gonna just overgrow the home. So shrubbery is important, but make sure it's the right plant for the right place. Um, we try really hard to make our front porches and our, um, our front doors um, the focal point of our house. So we have a couple of examples. All of these homes were on the same street. This home here, uh, you can see again, half of these front windows are covered and half of the windows on this side are covered as well. The uh, home in the middle, uh, done a really good job of blocking the view of the door and the porch from the road. I don't think that tree could get centered anymore. And it's such a lovely yard. Um, this home over here, is probably a much better uh, focus. Um, the, all of the windows are visible. I can actually see the porch and the front door. So when it comes to shrubbery, there are options that maybe we are not aware of that could uh, make the uh, choosing a plan, a planning for your uh, landscaping a little better. Um, I wasn't aware that they have a dwarf arborvitae. These are called tater tots. Um, that's exactly what they look like. Um, and they uh, are, while not quite dwarf, uh, they would work well as a foundation planting. Um, this is, we all love limelight hydrangeas, but we all know they get huge. So you might wanna consider, this is called a little lime hydrangea. Um, and uh, it still is not considered a dwarf, but it certainly um, is easier to deal with than the full size one. Lower petalums now come in all sizes, dwarf sizes. This is actually um, on the far right, I have a picture of a dwarf weeping lower petalum. If you're at a nursery, all this information is available um, on the back of, you know, if it has a, a ticket on it, um, it, all that information needs uh, sun, soil, all of that information is available. And if it's not, you can always find it online. So um, all kinds of new options out nowadays. Um, here's a, a few more low growers that could be used well, I think, as foundation plantings. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with just gumpo azaleas. They're a good low grower. They, um, they probably would reach the height of about 30 some inches. So they work well and they won't cover your windows. Um, dwarf mungo pines. They actually get a little taller, but they're slow grower and they're an interesting spreading uh, pine tree. Um, Korean boxwoods, um, about 24 inches high. Blue shore junipers are, get to be about the same size. They're a little temperamental, um, but they do provide a deeper, almost a blue uh, cast on their, uh, 
on the plant. And then I didn't know that there were creeping gardenias and I see many creeping gardenias and you get double duty on those. They're very, they have that lovely white bloom um, and it's also very fragrant. So these are perhaps some uh, low growers that you wouldn't wanna uh, overlook. So now we gotta talk about trees and, you know, Finding the right tree for the right spot can be a bit of a, of a hassle sometimes. I always compare it to finding a good spouse. So to find a good spouse, you know, you got to do your due diligence. You have to uh, do all your research. You got to meet the family. Uh, you got to know what it needs. And we probably should do the same thing with our trees because those mistakes can be very costly. Anyone that's ever been divorced knows that because you really have to live together in harmony for what, 50 years. So we wanna avoid those mistakes in trees. So if you don't have all the information you know before you go shopping, make sure you compile it. Um, I once spent, um, I think I paid $4 a piece for 12 Leland cypresses that I sweated over and planted. And I think it took me maybe 20 years uh, to, uh, before I had them removed and it cost me $2,200. So that was an expensive, that was an expensive lesson for me. So um, here in uh, Cherokee County, you know, a lot of builders uh, were mandated to do some plantings in their street trees in their yard. This is a this uh, community here was built in about 1999. Um, every single every single home on the street had a tree of about this size planted in the yard. Um, as you can see, it's wiped out any chance of him ever having any grass here. It overhangs the it overhangs the roof and of course nobody likes overhanging branches less than your insurance man and your home inspector so you want to make sure the mature height of a tree and also the the width of a tree before you choose it um, i used a couple of other examples this Holly Springs community here, this was built in 2009. So, you know, these trees are only 12 years old. And if they're on the north side, if you lived on the north side of that street, I think that you'd be giving up an awful lot of turf by now, um, being on the shady side of the street. So um, think carefully before you buy a tree and do your research. Um, uh, here are a few options maybe on if you're looking for a smaller tree. Um, who wouldn't want this lovely purple blooms uh, all summer long in their yard? So this first tree to the, uh, to the left is a chase tree or a vitex. Um, it's actually more it's shrubby, so it, it would grow naturally with multiple trunks, but it's easily um, pruned or trained to a single trunk. These purple flowers, these panicles, they go all summer long. So it's a great pollinator bush. Uh, it only gets to be maybe at the highest, it would be 20 feet. It is deciduous. So you don't see many of them around. Um, somebody once referred to them as the Southern Lilac, um, although those look nothing like lilac uh, trees, but similar only in color, but that's called a chase tree. So um, the next um, ornamental tree you may want to consider is often referred to as the best native flowering plant that no one ever plants. So um, these, while these blooms don't go all year, it's a, probably a late April bloomer. They are absolutely stunning when the tree is in bloom. 
the flower is actually like um, like uh, tassels, like white uh, tassels. Um, and again, it's also a shrubby tree, but it's it's well, it can be trained into one branch. Um, the rest of the year, it its foliage is dense and uh, thick, so it's a good yard tree. And then of course we have our native, um, so these two are native. I think the chase tree was actually imported from China. Um, this red bud here is always stunning in any landscape. This is a really good yard tree too. Um, it's a moderate grower and these pink flowers come out before the leaves. Um, so when it actually reaches maturity, it maintains a nice kind of level top so it makes a great yard tree. So these, like I said, these are probably maximum in the 20 foot range. Um, next, we've got some trees that get a little larger. Um, isn't this tree, this red tree to the left, a stunning tree? Um, that's actually a Chinese pistache tree. Now, you don't get any nuts on it, it's not a pistachio o tree, but it is uh, just a showstopper in the fall. Of course, all of these trees are pictured at their peak of beauty. So, but this, if this even came close to that in the fall, I would be excited certainly to have it in my yard. Um, and not only is it a pretty tree, but it also has um, berries on it. It has, you know, the berries that are green in the summer, they turn colors yellow and red in the fall also, but when all the leaves are off, the berries, the purple the berries become purple and they're great uh, winter food for our birds. So that is a Chinese pistache tree. Here's another good yard tree. Oh, size wise, this uh, pistache tree, it gets bigger. You know, it's probably a 30, it could be a 30 footer kind of depends on the environment. Um, this tree here is an um, American hornbeam tree. Um, it's sometimes called an ironwood tree. It's got a few names to it, but uh, again, a deciduous tree that's got a really full canopy, as you can see. It's very heat tolerant. Uh, it's very drought tolerant. Um, it does, it, sometimes it's hard to recognize. Um, uh, you can probably identi identify it best by its gray trunk. Um, and it maintains, it holds on to the leaves after, it, uh, after they die. So maybe that's a good way to identify it. Um, the other tree uh, that was recommended is a Georgia oak tree. Um, sometimes called a stone mountain oak. And this is one of the oaks that you only find in Georgia and Alabama and North Carolina. So uh, the advantage of this tree is, well, number one in the fall, it's also very nice. Uh, you know, oak leaves take on that kind of purple uh, hue um, and it has that gift that gives on giving and that's acorns. So it makes a nice uh, treat for wildlife in the winter. So those are three trees that perhaps you're not familiar with that you may want to consider if you are thinking of replacing any of your trees. So there are probably some trees you want to avoid. Not that there are bad trees, but if you're dealing with a small landscape, some of these trees are just impossible to manage. Um, we love to make fun of the Bradford pear trees. Um, they have their one week of glory in full white bloom, but unfortunately you gotta take what comes with that and that's the stink of uh, them. So, um, it's not just the smell that's offsetting, but they have a very bad branching habit and uh, they're very prone to storm damage. They break easily. So if you have a small yard, you probably don't want to 
uh, be planting weeping willows. Strictly a size issue. Uh, they get huge. They're kind of a messy tree. They drop those uh, long branches. Um, while uh, Magnolia grandiflora, that's the big mama. Uh, that's a beautiful tree, beautiful in any setting other than in a small yard. And it's not just, well, Magnolia, people are gonna hate me, but it's not just the tree, it's the leaves. Uh, you know, they're very hard to break up. Uh, they don't, they just never seem to disintegrate and they cover your yard like newspaper. Um, I love to look at sweet gums, but I hate to step on them and bare feet. So if you've got kids, um, probably not a good choice for a, a tree in your yard. So I'm sure the list can go on. These are just things that I've noted, people have pointed out to me. So if we're talking um, uh, about landscaping, we know some of the principles of design. We do need to, if we have the opportunity, we need to incorporate some color and some texture into our landscaping. And I think a good way to do this is just by looking up different avenues. Um, any variegated shrub um, looks so great next to a dark green background. Um, so this, uh, starting on the right, we have a false holly, great color, uh, variegated shrubbery always accents anything dark. Um, there are so many ornamental grasses out there. Uh, this is fountain grass. Um, just the texture is exciting. And then of course, for color, we have uh, lots of options um, as far as shrubbery. This is uh, obviously an encore azalea. So just break up that dark green scenery and the uh, waxy leaf that we normally have in our landscaping. Um, here's some more options. Um, some of these I wasn't all that familiar with, but I think that painted ferns, if you've got shade, uh, they get both texture and color and they highlight the rest of your landscape as well. Um, abelias, uh, I have abelias in my yard. They're variegated from a distance. They take on a yellow hue and um, they stand up very nicely against a boxwood. All the barberies that I knew about were always that deep burgundy color. But here's a new, uh, a new barbary called Sunjoy. And these, these are actually the leaves on it and it's a very vibrant color. And then also our Liriope. Um, this is a, a variegated Liriope. We like to use them as borders and they make a nice contrast with their variegated leaves as well. So don't forget to add a little color and texture. But sometimes our perennials and our flowering shrubs never seem to get their calendars right for when we want them at their peak. So I always think um, and buyers always note that when you use annuals, like a mass of annuals, it adds such color to your um, landscape. And they're always reliable. Um, I have impatience. Uh, they've been blooming since May and it's now November and they look almost as good as they did now. So if you're using annuals, however, you wanna make sure you incorporate uh, a lot of them. You know, putting like one or two in a row isn't gonna cut it. You really need a mass of them, just like this photo in the middle. Um, and if you don't have room in your landscape, you can always use them in a flower box. Um, if you're willing to water, you can use them in a, in a flower box. So, uh, yards and lawns. I think the expectation from most homeowners is that we're going to have some grass here. Um, so even if you have a shady yard and you can fit in some fescue, um, it has great curb appeal. Just the green, of course, it's got to be green and it's got to be weed free. 
And probably even a lot more important than that, if you have driveways and sidewalk, it's gotta be edged. Um, people do notice that. Um, so um, I'm not gonna talk about lawns. We still have our current great um, video on anything you ever wanted to know about turf. Uh, you can see it on our website, CherokeeMasterGardeners.com. Um, it's also on YouTube right now. It's a great program. Like I said, everything you ever wanted to know about turf. So not gonna talk to you about turf. But I do wanna talk to you about uh, making selections as far as maintenance goes. Isn't this a lovely maze? Just think of the time that it takes to maintain that. So yes, it's very beautiful. Um, not that anybody wants a maze in their yard, but we can certainly admire the diligence of whoever takes care of this, but we don't want to spend that much time in our yard. So if you're thinking uh, shrubbery or trees that need a lot of maintenance, uh, you may want to rethink them. Also, um, I've noticed that landscapes today are much more casual. Years ago, we used to see those, um, they look like uh, French poodle bushes and shrubberies where they were pruned uh, with stalks sticking out either ways. Um, nobody uses them anymore. We use a much more casual approach. So before you put in hedges in your front yard or uh, you know, a line of boxwoods, you wanna make sure that uh, it's not going to eat up all your weekends, unless that's what you want to do. <laughs> and we can't talk about landscaping without addressing mulch. Um, I always think that mulch, I always tell everybody, it's your landscape's best friend. Um, it does a myriad of things. First of all, visually, it adds that nice, crisp, manicured look. It has a dividing line. Um, but apart from that, it also keeps your soil temperature even, it retains moisture, and the best asset it has to me is that it controls the weeds. So I think of mulch as kind of the hairspray for that fancy hairdo you have. It holds our dues in place. So, and mulch comes in all kinds, all sizes, all colors. Um, uh, wood mulch is very popular. Here's our uh, Georgia pine mulch. And uh, I have a figure also on the far right of rubber mulch that is supposedly indestructible. I've not used it yet, but it certainly makes a nice appearance. So it's a must have in your landscape. Um, I also want to talk to you about edgy. Um, no bed, no landscaping is complete until it's got a nice clean edge. Whether it be your shovel keeping a natural edge, which is perfectly attractive uh, as long as it's kept up, but it's not just good enough to lay the pine straw down and let the grass in, uh, you know, fill in. So. There are thousands of ways to be a little creative with edges. Um, you can buy it at Home Depot. They have metal edging that you uh, step in. They have plastic edging that you pound in with anchors, um, pavers. A lot of people now are using pavers. Um, the top right photo has a nice wood um, that's been pounded in to create a very attractive uh, border. And if you have walkways, you know, they do double duties. They actually create the edge here and uh, provide a walkway. So it's, it's a nice way, just think of it maybe as a wider edge. So we, we all need definition to our landscape to separate it from the turf. Um, and occasionally we have to adjust for difference in heights. If you need a retaining wall in your yard, there's no reason that you can't dress it up. Um, 
uh, fences give certainly give definition as well. And then um, some of the stonework that I've seen out today, I mean, there are some fabulous retaining walls, borders made with stonework, um, all of which give good definition to your landscaping. So people also are curious as to what's new. Um, I already mentioned the flower boxes. I think they've become very popular. You know, they, they are maintenance. You know, some of them are supposedly self-watering, uh, but uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of growth out of a small area. So they are going to need daily watering, but I do see uh, flower boxes uh, nowadays. They become popular. Again, it's a good way to spread color. I've also seen, this is something fairly new, I see a lot of these eyebrow pergolas. I see builders using them to dress up the front of a house. Um, they're very attractive when used as a trellis. So I call them eyebrow pergolas. I'm not sure if that's actually the correct name, but uh, you can imagine how gorgeous this would be with a trumpet vine growing across it or uh, you know, a jasmine plant, uh, any viney uh, plant would do just a little something extra to spiff up the home. Okay, and of course, if, um, if we've got shrubbery, at some point, we are going to have to take care of it. So if we are certainly gonna be home barbers, we need to know what we're doing. Um, and um, again, we have another video that covers every ornamental shrub pruning that you would need to know. Um, I'm not sure if it's currently on our uh, uh, website, but it is available uh, on YouTube and uh, we'll share that link with you later on. Um, so before you grab your pruners, have a plan, know what you're doing. So, uh, what I've done here is just taken the main points that were conveyed in this uh, in the pruning video, and I've um, I've tried to assemble them into something very concise. So the first thing we have to uh, realize that when we're pruning is that timing is important, um, and a, probably the best rule of thumb to follow is simply that if it flowers. Uh, we want to prune it after it blooms. Um, that protects the bloom uh, and make sure that it's going to happen again next year. And also a reminder that you can safely remove up to a third of a plant. So if you're pruning something, you just don't have to take the shears and lop off the top. I mean, uh, uh, cut off the green layer. You can open up uh, the middle let some air, let some light in. Also, you want to remember that every cut brings a response. So where you make that cut, you're going to get some new growth. Make sure that's your intention and that's growth where you want it. And that you are not cutting bangs, as I said, but you're actually adding layers to your landscape. So this Take a look at this pour. I think that's probably a weeping cherry. Uh, right now it looks like a toadstool. So I really should have put number five on this list. And that's not every plant needs pruning. So just leave it be. Um, I actually passed by uh, what could have been a beautiful Japanese maple. I didn't get a picture of it because they were actually out in their yard, but they had pruned it to a perfect tire. So they took their shears and the top was perfectly flat. Um, it was shaped like a tire. So it looked like someone took stick, put a red tire on it. Um, but like I said, they were outside, so I didn't take a picture. Um, so, and another uh, illustration here is just be careful. Uh, if you're cutting the header off, uh, off a bush, it's probably not gonna end like you thought it would. So that's pruning in a nutshell. That's the concise version. Um, and I know this really sounds redundant, but you know, your shrubs aren't gonna last forever. 
So it's actually, if you've made some really bad choices or you've ended up with shapes you, you just can't live with, it, it's okay. Just take them out. Uh, most of them are not huge investments. You can replace them. So you don't have to live with uh, uh, bald uh, uh, shrubbery in your yard. So, so up to this point, we've really talked green. So everything that we've been talking about is um, a landscaping. So we've done a good job on our hairdo, but there's uh, maintaining some good curb appeal uh, requires uh, a little more than that. So there's a few other items I want to address that um, I think uh, can really boost your curb appeal with small amounts of money um, extended. And remember, we're investing, we're not just spending money on it. So the first thing, um, and I'm sure no one watching here is guilty of this, but we do see it a lot. So we've got our hair looking really good and we're ready to put on makeup, but ooh, first we're gonna to have to wash our driveway and we're definitely gonna to have to get any mildew off the side of our house. So um, if you've never uh, rented a power washer from Home Depot, I think that you can do your driveway, your sidewalk and your patio. Uh, for probably $75. Um, it's a kind of a backbreaking task just because you're hunched over. Uh, if you have a scarator, that makes the job real easy. But this is maintenance. Um, we live in the South. We have humid weather and we have leaves that uh, sit on our driveway sometimes, uh, long periods of time. Uh, washing your driveway is simply a maintenance item. And there's very few things that give that kind of appeal other than a nice white driveway to your house. So ooh to both of these, they're easily fixed and inexpensive. So paint, um, you know, your front door is the focal point of your house for anyone entering. So, um, every guest that you have, uh, if they are ringing the doorbell, you know, it takes a while for you to come to the door. They really have nothing to do but stare at your front door. So um, it does get looked at often, even though we probably go in through another door, we never see it, but you know, it's important to keep it clean. Um, in a real estate application, it's even more important. So if for some reason you're selling your house, um, any realtor who's showing it, it takes a while, you know, we come up to the house, we have to ring the doorbell to hopefully confirm that the seller is not there. Um, we have to get our lockbox out, our key ready, put in a, a code, wait till, it, wait till it picks up and open the door. So, you know, it may take a minute or two during that time, the buyer has absolutely nothing else to look at. They've noted every nick in your door. They've looked at your door hardware. They've looked at the door trim. So if you do nothing else, paint your front door. Um, your trim, that goes without saying. If by some reason you are in need of a whole house paint, um, I want to make some suggestions here. Most uh, a lot of, let's say a lot of the HOAs, they mandate that you have the color approved by them. And trust me, they do that for a reason. Painting your house is uh, kind of like buying that tree. You know, you got to live with it for a long time. Um, and it's very hard to correct mistakes and very expensive to correct mistakes. So HOAs uh, want you to get your color approved for the reason. So but if you're gonna go solo and make those selections, you may want to um, stop in at any paint store. They always put great uh, suggestions together. This is from Sharon Williams. Uh, these were, and they put the whole package together. So they suggest colors for the body of the house, the accent colors, trim colors, um, and there are hundreds of them to choose from. And they are actually all chosen by their professional designers. 
So let somebody that has the experience um, uh, make that decision for you. They also put together colors for cedar houses. And um, you can see there's a lot of uh, variation here. So um, it might be a job that you want to ask a pro, take their advice. So hardware, jewelry for your home. We all love jewelry, don't we? So uh, there's a couple of things that you can do to your front door, as I said, that improved it. Um, paint obviously being the least expensive one, but you might want to, when you're taking that assessment of your house, you might want to look at your front doorknob. Um, you know, if it's that old faux brass that's now um, all faded out and beat up, um, a new lock set would be a good way to invest some money. Um, and actually, there's no law that says your um, house number can only appear on your mailbox. As a matter of fact, they're not even uh, doing mailboxes anymore. They have uh, stations at the end of the street. So um, this is just a nice way that you could incorporate a little design in your house as well. And this kick plate, this brass kick plate, I think it's $12.99 or it used to always be $12.99 at Home Depot. Just gives a nice edge to the door. And your front mat, if your dog's been chewing your front mat, um, $10 for a new front mat makes a nice impression. Um, and one of my favorite subjects is entry lighting. Um, your porch fixture needs to be working, number one. It needs to be clean and it probably needs to be refreshed. You know, we have a lot of building that happened here in the 90s. Um, so if it's the same fixture and it's that faded brass, you can spiff that up with a can of black matte uh, spray paint. Um, and, uh, you know, if there's a, a bird nest or cobwebs on there, probably a good idea to clean that up. But I think that one of the most um, common errors that people make when they're choosing a light fixture, and that's the size. Y you want your front entry light fixture, if it uh, frames the uh, house, you want that to be significant. You want that to be able to be seen from a distance. Um, it's strictly decorative. I know that some of them don't get off a lot of light, but you've got floodlights to do that for you. This is just to add a little sparkle to your entrance. Uh, this uh, photo in the middle, that's actually a house that I pass by all the time on my walks. And I think they've just done a, such a nice job of adding curb appeal through their light fixtures, uh, their door, their entire color scheme. So if you are replacing that light and not just repairing the one you have, make sure it's significant, that it's visible. Um, and I guess we got to admit that today lighting, uh, keeping that best face forward is more than just a, a daylight um, effort. Um, you know, solar landscaping lighting has become very popular uh, if you've got enough sun to support it. And uh, if not, you may want to consider some low voltage lighting. Um, and nowadays they've come a long way. They have, uh, there are, collectors that you can put at one end of the house where you have sun to shine on the shadier side of the sun. So it just obviously um, low voltage lighting is a significant investment, um, but it does uh, showcase, certainly showcase your home. And lastly, um, I wanna talk to you about your garage. <laughs> um, spiffing up and Adding some class to your garage door is about a $12 endeavor, if you're interested. Amazon sells these kits of magnetic um, hinges and handles. Uh, and now I didn't even realize this, but they actually, these are all full windows for your uh, garage doors. They come in both stick on and screw on, and they are uh, certainly um, available. Um, on Amazon, I know they're there. I haven't really looked in any of the, the 
big box stores, but I'm, I'm sure that at some place they are available there. So one other note uh, in closing um, that I wanna uh, remind you about your garage door. Just a reminder that if you're not using your garage door, keep it down. Nobody wants to see your old tires, your stacks of storage bins, your uh, newspaper. Um, you work hard to get that nice polished look to your house. Um, having that garage do door always open, it's kind of like having your underwear showing. So if you're not using it, keep it down. That's probably the advice I'm going to end on. So. Um, Certainly, I, I want to thank all of you for um, attending. Uh, we are very grateful for the support you give our Cherokee County Master Gardeners. Um, we'd love to hear some feedback. I know we probably have some questions. I hope I can um, answer for you. So actually, um, at this point, Josh, I am going to turn this back to you. All right. Well, thank you, Nancy. You had me uh, laughing. I'm glad I was muted, but your uh, comment about the open garage door, uh, I think you also <laughs> probably relate to <laughs> underwear showing at the top of the pants with some of these garages being open. So um, I don't see any questions in the chat. Uh, if you guys would like to unmute yourself, if you have any questions um, from the plant side or from the uh, home curb appeal side, um, you know, we're on for another seven minutes here. So um, take the time and uh, let us know who you are and what your questions are. Hi, my name is Donna. Uh, I had trouble finding the link, so I was half an hour late. Is there somewhere I can see the first half of this presentation? Sure, Donna. We're going to get it recorded. Uh, well, it is it, it is recorded now. Uh, we'll get it posted on YouTube, um, you know, at least by the first part of next week. And uh, our folks that did the registration through Eventbrite, they'll, they'll have your email, so they'll send out the link uh, once it's up on YouTube. All right, awesome. thank you. Also, Josh, if I can jump in here, Donna, it might be in one of your um, junk file folders or spam file folder. Just check that. You mean the link? No, I mean in your email box. Right. Well, you mean the link to this seminar? Yes. Yeah, I found it, but it was, yeah, it was buried in last night's email. But thank you. Yeah. Uh, Raleigh? Uh, well, if you want to just, I think you're unmuted, so if you want to ask your question. Um, yes, um, I, I have a question about uh, if you, uh, in under the topic of uh, the wrong tree for the wrong place, um, we have quite a few crepe myrtles around our house that are probably now um, uh, close to 25 to 30 years old. We've always wanted, uh, we found them to be very messy trees mm -hmm. and I would love to have them removed, but th that's, is that beyond the realm of possibility cost-wise and um, uh, now that they're so old, it's just something you have to live with. Isn't that right? Well, I mean, where there's a will, there's a way. Um, have these been crate murdered and sort of topped every year or are they? No, fall? no, we've let them go. But I tell you, I am just really wanting to murder them instead of letting them go. They, they're they just, the they're very um, messy trees. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know, uh, you know, real, really they are, I, I can't even give an estimate of how tall they are, but consider a 25 year old crepe myrtle kind of close to your house. Yeah, yeah. They have the beautiful bark, you know, the peeling cinnamon bark. And I guess the shade would be a plus. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, 
but a tree that size, do you really think you would you would cut it down and then dig up the roots so you could put another tree in? Uh, especially if it's close to your house, you would probably just have the stump ground. Um, or, you know, if you weren't really wanting to replant in that same spot, at least for, you know, probably three to five years, um, you could just cut it. Um, but after cutting, you would want to treat that stump with a uh, system uh -huh. herbicide just to make sure. And, and I've done this with crepe myrtles and they are pretty tenacious. Uh, that's why they are such a great urban tree shrub uh, is even after treatment with herbicide, they grew back in my situation. So really, yeah, yeah they, they want to live. Um, but that, that would be probably your two best options is maybe have a tree company come out and give you an, an estimate on both grinding the stump or removal um, and then uh, treatment of that stump uh, with the herbicide. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, then, well, if anybody else has any questions, hope everyone has a great um, end of October weekend. Hopefully, the sun comes out eventually here. And uh, Nancy, thank you so much. I really enjoyed being on the listening end uh, and hearing it from the, the realtor's perspective or the home buyer's perspective. I can only imagine what uh, you and uh, a buyer might think if they walked uh, in front of my house. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got your chance. <laughs> no, I can't move anywhere. So. <laughs> anyway, thank you for the opportunity. Great. Well, thank you again, and uh, have a great weekend. Thanks for okay. joining us. Thank you. Okay.